Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Simona Lessig, and as the director of the German Historical Institute Washington, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's panel, Rethinking Memory and Knowledge During Times of Crisis, a panel which is due to its virtual format, a truly transatlantic, if not a transcontinental one. Times of crisis or times of decision. Confronted with a crisis, we must decide whether to take action or to simply let events run their course. When we decide for action, we often look to the past for guidance. References and allusions to the past abound in public discussions of crises. Think, for example, of recent calls for a Green New Deal in the United States as a response to the COVID-related economic crisis and to the long-term crisis of climate change. This presence of the past in present-day debates is one of the main reasons why the GHI organizes public events like today's panel discussion. Through our public events, we want to cast a critical eye on the ways the past is used in public debate, and we hope in the process to contribute a little analytical rigor to the discussion. Many of the GHI's public programs over the years have touched on the issue of racism, our focus today. As you might expect, as a German historical institute, we have often explored the racial ideology of uh, National Socialist Germany and the legacies of Nazi racism. Other public programs, however, addressed questions of race and racism in colonial contexts. And since we are always interested in transatlantic encounters and exchange, we organized a series of events on the experiences of Black GIs in Germany and on the impact of the African-American civil rights movement on movements for social change in West Germany. Our two-part program on racism in history and context, in other words, is not a knee-jerk response to recent events. It is rather a reflection of our long commitment to addressing one of the central issues of our era. Like the events I just mentioned, and like many other public events at the GHI, this program is a collaborative effort. I want to express my deep gratitude to and my deep admiration for our two partners today, the German Historical Association and the Institute of European Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Let me also voice my thanks to our panelists, to our moderators, and to everyone who participated in the organization of today's discussion. In the interest of time and only in the interest of time, I won't name all names, but give my special thanks to our own Elisabeth Engel, who developed the concept of today's event. I am truly impressed by the enormous response we have found. Uh, we actually have around 380 um, participants registered, and I look very much forward to our discussion. And so let me now turn matters over to the president of the German Historical Association, Eva Schlotheuber. Eva, the Zoom floor is yours. Hello and warm welcome also from my side. My name is Eva Schlotheuber. I'm the chairwoman of the German Historical Association and I'm delighted we are able to discuss this crucial topic together today. Pandemics can profoundly change societies. They mercilessly expose the weaknesses of status quo and they always have been and they still are the starting point for something fundamentally new. The Black Lives Matter movement has sparked a new debate on structural racism worldwide. But the important debate is meeting with a quite different situation in the US and in Europe. In Germany, racism looks different and spears not seldom the face of anti-Semitism. In various perspectives on current developments and their historical roots, that's exactly what interests us here in order to better understand what is happening at the moment. 
making the historical processes visible and the explanatory potential of historical research fruitful to a wider public is one of the central tasks of the German Historical Association. We are therefore very happy to engage into a public dialogue and also from my side many thanks to all involved who made this possible, especially to our wonderful coordinators Heike Friedmann from German Historical Institute and Frank Kell from the German Historical Association. Racism is deeply rooted in history, condensed in monuments and places of remembrance. Therefore, we want to focus on rethinking memory and knowledge during times of crisis in the first panel. The second panel on October 29th will deal with protest movements and state power. We are, as Simone has just said, more than 300 viewers today, expecting more than 300 viewers today. Please note that the audience is automatically muted and your video is turned off. We would like to invite you though to participate via the Q&A box, chat box. The moderators will try to address as many questions as possible. That's it for the organizational notes for the moment. And now I'm very pleased to introduce to you our moderator, Dr. Akasimi Newsom. She's Associate Director at the Institute of European Studies at the University of Berkeley. She is a political scientist who works on labor, comparative racialism, and the EU in crisis. Much to do these days. Akasimi, I'm very happy you're with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Simona and Eva. I will now turn to the panel. Ana Lucia Araujo is professor of history at Howard University. Manuela Baucha is postdoctoral fellow at the Otto Sur Institute at the Free University of Berlin. Norbert Frey is chair of modern history and director the Jena Center for 20th Century History at Friedrich Schiller University of Jena. And then we have Michael Rothberg, who is 1939 Society Samuel Goetz Chair in Holocaust Studies and Professor of English and Comparative Literature at UCLA. Francisco Betancourt, Charles Boxer Professor of History at King's College London, will be co-moderating the discussion with me. Thank you all for your participation and for joining us today. So just to get us started, this first question I have, I'm addressing to all the panelists and I hope you all take a turn to answer it. As an introductory statement, could you give the audience a sense of the geographic, temporal, and analytical scope of your work on historical questions of memory and memorial cultures of racism? Ana Lucia, could you go first? Yes. Uh, then thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, my work, I, am, I was born and raised in Brazil, the, the country that uh, imported the largest number of enslaved Africans during the era of the Atlantic slave trade, also the country that uh, abolished, uh, was the last country to abolish the slavery uh, in the Americas. Then my work uh, deals essentially with uh, the 19th century up to the present and uh, with public memory of slavery, then I look at how uh, social actors, either whites, uh, descendants of slave owners, descendants of slave merchants and descendants uh, of enslaved people, how they have been uh, occupying the public space to, um, to reinterpret this uh, past associated with uh, slavery and the Atlantic slave trade. Then in terms of his scope, of course, my work at uh, it started uh, in Brazil, uh, also in West Africa, Republic of Benin. And uh, as I have been living in the United States now for 12 years, uh, then the United States is now an important part of my work. And I make connections with other places where I conduct the research and uh, field work like England and France. Then uh, my work is transnational because uh, is slavery and the Atlantic slave trade, they were also uh, transnational. Thank you so much, Ana Lucia. Manuela? Um, yes, um, good evening uh, from speaking from Germany. Um, it's evening here and thank you also for having me. Um, 
Yes, on your question, I believe, I mean, I hope I won't be too long, but I guess it's maybe helpful to give an idea of what I'm working on at the moment. I'm, as you said, based at Free University in Berlin, and I'm head of a project which is called Geschichte der Ine Straße 22, History of Ine um, Straße 22. And um, the project is centered around the history of a building that now belongs to Free University and the Institute of Political Science, where I work, is based there. But it was built in 1927. It's actually not only a building, it's a whole compound. It was built in 1927 as um, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Human Heredity and Eugenics. Um, I will call it KV Art Shorter in the following. And um, it's um, a very problematic, uh, the KV is a very problematic history. It was you know, like the most important um, institute in Germany and also very important internationally. Um, it uh, conducted research on what we would today call human genetics, um, but was linked uh, very strongly to the eugenicist movement. It conducted uh, racial research. It was also um, had closed links to the Nazi eugenicist and racial politics um, scientists also, which is, you know, like the most dramatic history title that actually um, also accepted that allowed that people, um, concentration inmates were actually murdered in order for the scientists to conduct um, research on their body parts and so on. So it has a really complicated and really um, um, problematic history and um, this history is not very visible at on the historical grounds. There's a commemorative plaque that has been put up and fought for in the late 1980s which is still there but actually it's not uh, very visible and what we're doing in the project is that we are uh, drafting ways, a concept uh, for how to, you know, how this history can be made more visible on the historical grounds and um, you know, talking about histories of racism, this uh, has obviously, the building has a history of racism. It has a history of dehumanization, I would say, um, because it's broader. And what I'm really interested at, at the moment, um, that's why I'm very grateful actually to be able to do this project is that I believe it, it, it is um, the, the, the building and the KVR um, is actually a very good example for, histories of injustices which we have come to remember and to tell separate from each other and um, which here you know intersect in one building so we have a history that um, is linked to the sterilization of um, disabled people it's linked to the sterilization of um, afro-germans and asian germans it's linked to uh, the persecution of jews um, through um, issuing um, ancestry certificates. Um, it's built, to, it, it's linked to uh, the persecution of Sinti and Roma very importantly. So um, we have, you know, all these histories that we are all remembering, if we are remembering them separately. And what I'm really interested in is to um, find ways also to narrate them in their entanglements actually. So yes, that's maybe too, hopefully not the too long introduction, what I'm doing and how that links into uh, memories of uh, memory cultures of racism. Thank you so much, Manuela. Uh, Norbert. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me in this uh, distinguished panel. And actually, I would also like to give you a brief uh, impression of my work. Uh, I started out as a young uh, scholar on Nazi Germany and I began, began working about the post-Nazi uh, history in the 1980s and at that time it was uh, I was mostly interested in how the Germans reflected about their Nazi past in the 1950s and how they dealt with the aftermath of allied denazification and re-education politics of the Nuremberg trials and the arm. And I summarized uh, at that time my findings in a book called Vergangenheitspolitik, Politics of the Past During the Adenauer Era. And at that time in the mid 90s, memory studies were actually 
only in its beginnings, not only in Germany, I guess, and only a few knew about post-colonial studies. Looking back, I would argue that until the late 1970s or so, racism was not really a topic for contemporary historians in Germany. Of course, after the screening of the miniseries Holocaust, a wave of new research on the perpetrators began the so-called Täterforschung. And after the Goldhagen book, there was also new research on the specificity of uh, Nazi anti-Semitism. And some of us were already interested in, in anti-Semitism's uh, post-war afterlife. But as historians of the Federal Republic, we actually understood anti-Semitism after 1945 as a, I would even say, marginal issue as remnants of Nazi ideology, which in the course of, of time would hopefully simply die out. And probably even more important, we did not explicitly conceive this anti-Semitism as racism. For too long, we did not make a connection between these older forms of genocidal racism and new occurrences of racism, uh, for instance, against the so-called guest workers who became part of Germany's workforce during the so-called economic miracle of the 1960s. Hardly anyone mentioned that these new labor migrants reminded him or her of the forced laborers of Germany's wartime economy. In fact, I would say that German contemporary historiography still does not do justice to the fact that about a quarter of the people living in Germany now have a so-called migration background, Migrationshintergrund, as it is called in German. It may not be an expression of racism that they are not part of the picture which we as historians are painting about today's Germany, but it demonstrates an ignorance that in my view is no longer acceptable. Thank you so much, Norbert. Michael? Hi, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, great to be here uh, in LA in this morning and speaking with all of you. And, um, I guess I would call myself in the shortest terms a scholar of comparative memory studies with a particular interest in the politics of memory. And in that sense, my work really intersects with all of the projects and ideas that you've just heard from the three other panelists. But I wanted to actually say a word about how I got to this point. Um, for the last 25 years or so, I've been working in the field of Holocaust studies. Um, I'm a literary and cultural critic, and that means that I've focused primarily on the representation and the memory of the Holocaust. But of course, the basis of that also has to be historical. And so when I teach the Holocaust, there's always a significant historical uh, component. I wasn't trained in Holocaust studies when I was in the university, at least in the field of literary studies, there really was no training in this field. So it really came out of my own kind of passionate reading when I was in my early 20s of books like Gita Sereny's Into That Darkness, uh, Primo Levi's uh, The Drowned and the Saved, Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, watching films like Shoah. Um, eventually, I discovered testimonies by people like Charlotte Delbo and Ruth Kluger, which led me to uh, my concept of, of traumatic realism, which was uh, the center of, of my first book. But all along when I was uh, starting out and becoming interested in the field of Holocaust studies, I had what I considered sort of separate and parallel interests in post-colonial studies and, uh, and African-American literature. And then I kind of made a discovery through the book, uh, The Black Atlantic by Paul Gilroy, that what I had considered as, as interests that were on separate tracks and, and simply parallel were actually kind of intersecting interests, right? And that there were common themes in particular around trauma, memory, and justice that united, uh, let's say the black diaspora and, and the Jewish diaspora. And I'm speaking in pretty simplistic terms, obviously, just because of the, of the format that we're in. And so Gilroy's book really had a, had a big influence on me and, and started 
forced me to start to think about how I could bring together some of what I thought of as separate interests. And then I kind of took another step when I discovered a short text um, by the great African-American intellectual and activist W.E.B. Du Bois, who led me to see that not only were these interests sort of parallel and intersecting, but they were actually interacting also. And the, and the text that really did that for me was, was something he wrote in 1952 called The Negro and the Warsaw Ghetto, where he recounted uh, visiting the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1949 and talked about the impact that seeing that absolute devastation of the ghetto had had on him. And what struck me and what was really interesting to me was not only that he had this kind of strong empathetic response toward the victims, which anybody I think would have, but that that kind of uh, that experience actually forced him to rethink his own ideas about race and to recalibrate and to reframe his own experience. And Du Bois at that point in, the, in 1949 had been uh, for a half a century thinking about questions of race uh, in, particularly, in particular in African-American and, and, and bigger African diaspora and African contexts. But seeing the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto actually he says in this short essay, got him to kind of rethink uh, his, his understandings of race and to think of them in more relational terms, a little bit like what Norbert Frey just described for post-war Germany, coming to see how anti-Semitism interacts with other forms of racism. And Du Bois's essay also then led me to new thinking about how memory works, because what really struck me about this, this, this very short article by Du Bois was that he managed to preserve a very specific understanding of the Holocaust, the Holocaust in all its singularity, but also its relationality to other forms of racial violence. And it was that combination of specificity and relationality which led me to my, my notion of multidirectional memory. And I think what's just to make a last point, what was so interesting to me also about Du Bois's essay, again, published in 1952, was that this was a moment when there really wasn't a sense of the specificity or uniqueness of the Holocaust. It really took another decade before that idea emerged. So to see Du Bois developing this notion of specificity or singularity ahead of, really ahead of his time, but at the same moment, linking it to the experiences of other racialized subjects, was very powerful, me, powerful for me and kind of led me to rethink not just Holocaust memory in particular, but also memory more collective or cultural memory more broadly. Thank you so much, Michael. Now I'll turn the questions over to you, Francisco. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to interact with uh, these excellent uh, participants. And um, I, am, uh, I studied also racism and I, I tried to understand the depth, the historical depth of these uh, discriminatory actions. Uh, I tried to relate it to um, monopolization of resources. For me, racism is always a political project to exclude people and to monopolize resources. And uh, I'm interested in not only re relational uh, racism, how it is all related, the different forms of racism, but also the plurality of, of racism. So uh, for, this, for this panel, <clears throat> I'm also interested uh, in uh, um, recent political movements, Black Lives uh, uh, Matters, for instance, because it has an impact and it has been in a certain way reshaping collective memory and it has contributed to, to that and it calls attention for this uh, process now of identity and how they also contribute to reshape uh, uh, memory and the question i would like to ask the participants is this one how has uh, the historical issue of decolonization impacted collective memory in the united states in the United Kingdom and uh, in Germany. And we could, uh, we could uh, start perhaps with Norbert. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I would argue that um, the issue of decolonization is only, to be, is only beginning to become part of Germany's collective memory. 
And this is the case not only because Germany, as you know, lost its colonies already after World War I, um, so that neither the Federal Republic nor the GDR was close to the politics of decolonization after 1945, which took place all over the globe. It is also because of the centrality of the Nazi past in Germany's collective memory and its, in its uh, historical culture. Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with the past, never meant confronting the nation's colonial past, but confronting the Nazi past and in particular the Holocaust, the break of civilization during and within the war. And I'm sure you are aware that it was only after two decades of verdrängung, of psychological repression and denial, that the task of Vergangenheitsbewältigung became socially more accepted in Germany. And it was not until the 1990s that a majority of Germans subscribed to this concept. I mean, this was a development which, which took 20 years or so uh, to get to the point where the centrality of the Holocaust was really societally accepted. And to that extent, uh, I'm sorry, and to the extent that uh, unified Germany gained international recognition for just this willingness to take on historical responsibility, something like a new cultural identity emerged from it. I mean, the political culture of Germany, let's say from the mid 1980s starting, uh, really became focused on uh, the issue of the Nazi past and in particular the Holocaust. And despite some challenges from the far right, I think it is still safe to say that this Nazi past serves as a negative anchor of Germany's collective self-image. I mean, there are challenges now, of course, and there are uh, uh, politicians who are calling for a uh, 180 grad wende, a turnaround uh, in, in memory, uh, in collective memory. memory. But uh, this is still uh, only on, on the right uh, an accepted uh, argument, uh, while the political class of uh, Germany actually uh, stands with the concept of auseinandersetzung mit der Vergangenheit, coming to terms with the past. And there are even those uh, words like Erinnerungskultur, which is something, uh, culture of memory, which uh, the Germans uh, believe they can be proud of. Um, and you all also might know that uh, Joschka Fischer once uh, modified the original formula, never again war, nie wieder Krieg, uh, into never again Auschwitz, which also reflects the centrality uh, of, of the Holocaust. If a nation is historically and politically impregnated in this way, it is not easy, uh, or it is at least not that easy to turn uh, to the German crimes in the colonial era, I would say, without fearing that this might be understood as a relativization of uh, the Nazi crimes. But I think that the German public today is a lot further on its way to confront its own colonial past than it was, let's say, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Well, thank you so much. This was a, a very good uh, uh, beginning of this uh, of this question. Uh, so um, let's uh, proceed, uh, perhaps with uh, Manuela. Yes, I can. Um, I can follow up on that actually very well. I guess I think. Um, well, Norbert Freyer said, you know. German society is beginning to confront its um, colonial history. I mean, I think we also have to 
you know, if we wanted to, we could research that closer and see that already, you know, in the 1980s, you had groups um, um, working on that history. You had exhibitions, the first exhibitions on the history of German colonialism and so on. Um, um, that would be actually really interesting to look also at these, um, uh, at these earlier um, uh, ways to, to, to address it, um, this history. But yes, I mean, it's true, I would agree that, um, let's say until, you know, 2000, 2004, uh, at latest, 2004 has been, you know, a really important year for the, for, for the remembrance um, um, to, to colonialism in Germany, because it was a commemoration of 100 years of um, the beginning of the war against the Nama and uh, Herero, the, um, of the Germans against the Nama and Herero in Namibia. And um, it was a point where, you know, I think uh, the debate in the newspapers on the topic uh, started to grow. Um, so beyond post-colonial and decolonizing groups um, that had always and um, for a long time already engaged with that history. And what I find really interesting actually is that, that I have the impression that there's a huge interest actually in the history of German colonialism. Um, in 2016, the German Historical Museum um, opened its uh, special exhibition on the history of German colonialism. I think it was one of the most um, successful exhibitions um, they, they ever showed. Um, uh, and I think also, you know, we're all teaching and I, I don't know about your experiences, but when I'm teaching um, on the history of colonialism, it's like, you know, I have to split the classes because there's so many people coming. So, um, uh, and also colleagues who are teaching on post-colonial theory and so on. So there's a huge interest in all these topics. Um, there's a debate in the newspaper. There's been uh, the campaign uh, against the Humboldt Forum, which has been an important a catalyzer also, I mean, not the Humboldt Forum has been the catalyzer, but the, the debate and the campaign against the Humboldt Forum has been a catalyzer for all these debates. Um, there's uh, now still the debate on um, restitutions, uh, first of human, of human remains, but also of colonial artifacts. Um, so um, the debate is actually there. And of course, we all have also the research on uh, historical research, which has been influenced by post-colonial theory and research in you know, advocating for um, us to look also at the ways colonialism um, worked and shaped societies, not only in the colonies, but also in the metropoles, you know, work of um, Sebastian Conrad and Charlene Miranderia, uh, which followed the works of Frederick Cooper and, and Laura Stoller and so on. So we have the huge interest and we have um, scholarly work on that. Um, and then on the other hand, we have, um, and I think that is also uh, what Norbert Frey, you know, hinted at, we have also official memory politics, which um, are very slow in reacting to that interest and into taking these narratives into account. And there's, I would say, a reluctance actually to take that narratives into account. And that has um, to do, I would say, also with, with hegemonies in memory politics, but which I would argue are not created by those who are affected by these, you know, the communities who are actually affected, but which are really made, um, being made by um, the state and um, to mention one example, which I found really interesting, is um, the, the coalition agreement of the current German government. Um, it was drafted in 2017, 2018. And what's interesting is for the first time, we have a coalition agreement, which acknowledges that um, colonialism should be integrated in memory politics. This is really new. But what's interesting is you have to look at the wording and um, it mentions colonial German colonialism as colonial Geschichte. So it does not even acknowledge that we are, you have a history of colonial rules, so of colonial regimes. It mentions colonial history you know, as, a, uh, as an era, while on the other hand, it talks very clearly of uh, the Nazi past as NS terror herrschaft, so as a, a rule of terror, and um, of um, the GDR as SED dictatur, as a dictatorship, and so on. Um, so you have 
even in this coalition agreement, which I would say is remarkable for its integration of um, colonialism or something that should be remembered, the, this hegemony that, that we can see in um, memory politics. And of course, what Norbert Frey also hinted at is we have in, in his first statement is that um, we still have the separation of, uh, uh, of these eras, although you could also, um, this is what also has been done in research, you know, look at um, the, the strong relationships between, um, for instance, the building of colonial knowledge and then the use of colonial knowledge in later uh, eras in the Weimar Republic and also um, during National Socialism. Um, so, yes, to make it short, I mean, there's this huge interest. And then on the other hand, there's like official uh, memory politics, um, which um, are reluctant to take that into account. And I think which are always, you know, in fear of being accused of relativization, which I, I, as I understand, maybe that's something I would love to debate that with Mike Rothbeck actually, <laughs> but I have the impression that um, that's an accusation which is often not even being made by those who are really, you know, affected, personally affected or have familiar ties um, with all these histories of injustices, but uh, which actually comes from a conservative um, political part, which is instrumentalizing actually um, communities for other reasons. Well, th <clears throat> thank you so much. You have, uh, Manuel, you have enlarged significantly the field of, uh, of reflection uh, on, this, on this question. And uh, I'm sure we will go back to, to some of the issues you, you raised yourself, which are very interesting uh, concerning politics of memory and also how some institutions react uh, in different ways and uh, some of them are some of them are more open than others uh, we will we will go back to to that i think it's a very it's a very interesting issue uh, among all the others you 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 have you have raised very well so uh, perhaps now um uh, michael could enlarge it even more this field and uh, and show more comparisons michael <laughs> Sure, thanks. Yeah, I have a lot to say about the uh, conversation that's emerging uh, with Norbert Frey and Manuela Baucha, and I'm really fascinated with those questions and what's happening in Germany right now. I actually took this question in a slightly different direction initially, and then maybe we can come back to some of those issues as well. So you asked about the relationship between decolonization and memory cultures, Francisco. And, and so what I first, my first thought was, okay, I think about decolonization actually in two ways, or at least on two levels. The first level, I think of it as a particular period, a particular historical period in which colonized peoples uh, um, resisted and, and overthrew colonial powers. Um, and, if, and, and on the second level, I think of it, and this is maybe closer to the way we've been discussing it so far, as an ongoing process of decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing memory. Um, uh, which is partly a sign that the initial area of decolonization was not fully successful, as I think probably most of us would agree. But at that first level, decolonization as a period, it's obviously, this is something that's going on for decades, even centuries, but there's a particularly intense period of decolonization between, let's say, the end of the Second World War and the early 1960s. So something like 45 to 62, which is the independence of Algeria, when dozens of countries in Africa and Asia become independent. And that, that period in particular has been important for me. And the reason it was important for me as I was thinking about what I've, what I've called multi-directional memory is because this is a period when, again, you have this intense period of decolonization, wars of decolonization in, in, uh, in Vietnam, in Algeria, um, stuff happening in, in Africa, obviously, in other parts of Africa as well. It's also the period of the emergence of Holocaust memory, um, which really starts to happen in a way that is familiar to us around 1961 and the Eichmann trial, right? That's usually considered a kind of major turning point in the emergence of a public and sort of global Holocaust memory. So this early period between 45 and 61 um, is one in which you, you have other things going on. And, and what I discovered was that, and I'm gonna take a slight detour from the national context that Francisco mentioned, because for me, France uh, was a particularly important context for thinking about decolonization and, and memory culture. And what I came to realize was that the Algerian War of Independence 
as seen from France, especially among people who were kind of struggling against the war, anti-war activists or supporting the FLN, what they were, and many of whom were also people who had been uh, imprisoned by the Nazis, active in the resistance against the Nazi occupation, they were seeing echoes in the way that France was waging the war of what had happened under Nazi occupation. And the key terms were things like torture um, and concentration camps. And then against that, the importance of testimony. And so what I started to see was that in this very moment when you didn't yet have a recognizable Holocaust memory, you were getting all of this cross-referencing between what was happening at the moment in Algeria and in France in relation to the Algerian war and these memories that were starting to emerge um, from the Nazi occupation, from Vichy, from the Holocaust. And so what I came to see is that the struggle for decolonization, at least in France, catalyzed Holocaust memory culture. And then inversely, Holocaust memory became a kind of weapon in this anti-colonial struggle. And so references to Nazi torture, references to Nazi camps, of which there were many, I discovered, in this period of the late 50s and early 60s, also became a kind of rhetorical weapon to use against the French state. So there was this really interesting interaction going on. So that for me is important in thinking about decolonization as a period and the way it interacts with, with memory cultures. I mean, as an ongoing project, um, I think it takes related but different forms probably in the three countries that you mentioned, the US, the UK, and Germany, partly because they have very different relations to colonialism, right? We've talked a little bit about Germany and the particular case there. In the US, I'd say we are, you know, in some ways technically a kind of post-colony, which is actually also a settler colony and also a neo-colonial power. So there's a lot to decolonize, I guess I would say. And I think in the UK, it's something similar is true too, though I'm not an expert. You have one of the most, the most extensive colonial uh, network, right, which then falls apart, is decolonized, and yet the UK remains very much a post-imperial country where, the, where I think the legacies and the traces of that empire are still very much there, and you see that right all the way up into Brexit and, and everything that's been happening recently, as far as I know it. So what would it mean to think about about memory cultures in relationship to decolonization in this ongoing sense. I mean, I think it's a really big, it's a really big question and there's a lot to do. I guess, you know, the two realms that I think are important are on the one hand, it involves recalibrating national narratives, right? If we're gonna decolonize memory cultures, at least in the formerly colonial or neo-colonial contexts, part of what, what we need to do is to recalibrate the national narratives. And I think that's partly what, what uh, Norbert and Manuela have been talking about in terms of Germany. How do we recalibrate German national memory, uh, not just centered on the Holocaust, but also on this, on this other colonial history. And I think we also need to think about material reparations, right? And that's something that, of course, uh, Anna has, has written a lot about and came up in Manuela's uh, comments as well. So there's, we need to be, tearing down monuments, putting up new monuments, recontextualizing monuments, changing museum exhibitions, changing education curricula uh, to reflect a kind of more decolonial uh, uh, perspective on things. Um, and we need to be thinking about reparations, reparations for slavery, the return of, of, of rema human remains as Manuela evoked in certain contexts. There's a huge amount of work to be done. I guess if I could just make one comment about the German context, because I have been thinking about this a lot recently. I think that there's often a tendency, and this is certainly not just true in Germany, it's been, it was true in the United States as well, to think about the ways that Holocaust memory may have blocked, right, off other memories. And I actually think that's my whole, my whole theory is that that's not exactly how it works, or that's not actually how it works. And I think it's interesting to think about the German case because as Norbert Frey described it, I think, and I would, I mean, certainly agree entirely with what he says, is it took decades really before a Holocaust memory culture started to emerge and certainly many decades before it became central and to the official culture of, of a unified Germany. And I think, let's say, accepted by the vast majority of people, which I think that it, it is. So in all of those decades, right, there was also not much being done on colonialism, but it wasn't because the Holocaust was an over, you know, overwhelming presence, it's because there wasn't much memory work being done at all. And it's interesting, Manuela, that you mentioned the 1980s as also a moment when there were early 
uh, kind of engagements with colonial history because of that's, that's of course the decade when there were various grassroots, grassroots projects emerging in Germany as well around monuments and history and Jenny Wustenberg's really great book, um, uh, Civil Society and Memory in Postwar Germany is exactly about that period of the 1980s. And this is the period when memory starts to emerge from below. And it seems to me that, that it would be interesting, and I'm not an expert and I don't know this, but to, to really think more about the dynamic interactions between the development of Holocaust memory and the development of interest in colonialism. Because I don't think it's at all a question of blocking and screening, except maybe at the state level that Manuela mentioned where I would agree with her there. But it would really be interesting to look at the grassroots level and to think about how these different projects maybe emerge partly in parallel and maybe with some, with some interactions that we could trace. I'll stop there. Thank you, Michael. You have um, developed this comparison in a very successful way. And you have also reflected on decolonization of knowledge, culture, and memory. And uh, while you were uh, talking, I was thinking about your book, your recent book, uh, The Implicated Subject. And I was thinking whether there is uh, also, or there are also implicated states who were not involved directly in recent uh, colonization, but uh, they, they can be considered also in, implicated in, uh, uh, indirectly <laughs> in this uh, 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 colonial uh, atmosphere. So I think that it's, it's very uh, stimulating all, all, this, all this discussion. And now uh, I, would, I would like to ask Anna Lucia to, to intervene here, uh, who will certainly uh, lead us to other continents and other, and other subjects. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think that we, we can think about the, the issue of decolonization also uh, in the sense that it has been discussed more recently, but also in terms of the period, uh, I believe that when you are uh, especially discussing, uh, discussing the issue of slavery, then the period that starts then with the, the end uh, the, of the, the Second World War is a, is a crucial moment. One of the elements that um, to consider when you are talking about collective memory is that in these nations that either participated in the Atlantic slave trade or where slavery existed, uh, there is no single collective memory of these uh, atrocities. Then we have a collective memory of those who are descendants of enslaved people, those who are descendants of slave owners, slave merchants, of people who in many ways, for example, in African countries, perhaps were middlemen who collaborated with those who traded in uh, human beings, but who are not necessarily direct uh, perpetrators that joins the, the discussion that Michael did in his, last, um, in his last book. But that moment of the Second World War, of course, is, is crucial because it's the moment then that is going to, to launch uh, the decolonization movement in Africa and also in the Caribbean. And this is going, of course, to generate also an international solidarity that you are going to see uh, then in the United States and then with the, the, uh, the rise of the, the civil rights movement, it's going to be a, a crucial moment. But it's still nothing of this is a sort of linear movement. We had countries such as Angola that was until the 1970s is still a Portuguese colony. We had also uh, the case of South Africa, then we have the apartheid that you are not referring here, but uh, these were uh, regions that were not at all going towards the direction of uh, decolonization. And then with the rise of the Cold War, uh, in the United States, the, the, the context will be different, but in Latin America and in countries like Brazil, the Cold War and with the, the, uh, the dictatorships that will be in place uh, in these countries uh, supported by the United States, you are not going to see then uh, until the 1980s, early 1990s, then a movement that we could say um, walked uh, in the direction of uh, decolonization. Then all this, um, all this, this debate, uh, of course, uh, it is uh, on decolonization. Uh, 
was crucial, but it, it is lasting until, until today, we can say. And one moment that I think that will be uh, important in this, uh, in this process is going to be then the, the end of the, the Cold War. Then a moment, uh, then end of the 1980s, when all these debates about memory of slavery started then in Africa. Uh, became more visible also in the United States and uh, in Europe uh, and uh, Latin America as well. And here is an, uh, one point that I think that is interesting for us to think about these connections between uh, memory of slavery and memory of the, the Holocaust is that is really at that moment after the end of the Second World War that Black activists, Black social actors, and Black organizations who also start claiming the Holocaust as a, a crucial landmark to demand uh, reparations for slavery. Uh, many of the initiatives that will emerge uh, very gradually during this period to memorialize uh, slavery then uh, will be inspired uh, by uh, what was done in relation to the, the Holocaust. And here again, all this discussion about um, collective memory, also based in narratives. We know that the slave narratives, they existed then since uh, in, in writing as a, a literary genre uh, since the, the, the 18th century. But one crucial um, event we could say in the case of the United States is the publication of uh, Alex Halley's uh, Roots in the 1970s, then before the end of the Cold War. And then the, that series, Roots, that also had an impact uh, in public memory, not only in the United States, but uh, in Africa, in Brazil, we all uh, watch that series. And this idea of who you are, what is your name, and uh, the idea also of having an interest for, um, in terms of uh, uh, searching um, then your own genealogy, this is also an impact of that, uh, of that moment. But what you can say then in terms of what is happening now uh, regarding this, uh, this moment uh, and debates about the decolonization, is uh, we could identify three elements. Then first of all, the, the fall of the, the, the monuments to white supremacy and monuments honoring then slave owners or slave merchants. And these we saw here in US, it started be of course before, um, before this year, but this year it became more visible. Uh, we saw the same process also happening, of course, uh, in England. Uh, we saw then happening in Germany and in other places where these monuments are also being, being challenged. And then in parallel uh, with that, you are going to have also these demands, one, to create monuments honoring then social actors who fought uh, to abolish slavery. Um, and uh, who resisted this labor as well, monuments, for example, to, to men and women who, who led rebellions and so on. This trend perhaps was more visible in countries, in Caribbean countries, exactly with the monument, uh, with the moment of um, the colonizing period, but here in the United States, this is, is more recent. And of course, uh, this demands uh, that you have been seeing, especially since the 1990s and the growing inclusion of uh, the, the, the history of these atrocities uh, in the museum. Then we, what is interesting here is that topics related to my work then, first how slavery is memorialized and then the issue of reparations, symbolic and material and financial. And now also, of course, with uh, all these uh, demands uh, to, to repatriate and to, to restitute these objects, artifacts, and so on, and material culture that was uh, looted from African countries, uh, in particular, 
than during the, the colonial period. Then this is a history that is not, it's an unfinished history. Uh, I am not very optimistic uh, regarding uh, how the term decolonize in the museum, decolonizing uh, particular spaces is something that is more of a brand, but um, it's uh, certainly a debate that uh, we are forced now to, to engage because uh, people, they are uh, taking the, these actions in their, into their own hands. Then uh, institutions, as Manuela mentioned, perhaps this official memory is, is lower in order to incorporate the, the voices uh, from the streets, but uh, what is happening now in this, uh, our different countries is that uh, these institutions, they have to do something regarding uh, this colonial past. And uh, you are going to watch uh, what will be uh, the, the next chapters. Thank you so much, Anna Lucia. You have really uh, introduced uh, the continents and uh, namely uh, Latin America and uh, and how social movements um, uh, reshaped collective memory concerning a apparently distant colonial past, but in which uh, the presence of slavery was very heavy until uh, recently and uh, until the present. Basically, it has repercussions into uh, heavy repercussions into the present. And you also. Uh, um, highlighted the relation between slavery and Holocaust and how the memorialization of, of the Holocaust inspired memorialization of, of slavery. And then um, you also uh, introduced this issue of monuments and the fight struggle uh, around these monuments and the institution and the restitution of heritage. We will probably go back to this issue because I think it's crucial. And uh, we have we have many cases, uh, for instance, I was thinking about uh, the work uh, Wayne Bodest has been doing in Leiden, but uh, uh, we have many other, many other examples. Uh, so it's, we'll go back to that. So I would like to call our audience to ask questions because they can use the, this icon, questions and answers, and, uh, and ask questions that we can, we can uh, um, uh, pick up and uh, and, and use to, to, to make this um, panel even more lively. Uh, and now uh, I pass the floor to Akasemi. Thank you. We could go on far beyond 90 minutes, I'm sure. So um, fascinating um, all these comments have been so far. So uh, I want to turn your attention to the question of comparison. So one of our audience members wonders about, for example, the GDR specifically and left-wing Germans in the 60s and 70s. Didn't they uh, have a unique uh, reworking of colonialism and identify, in fact, with third world revolution and anti-colonial movements? How do uh, current day discussions about not only decolonization, but also the legacy of Nazism differ from these earlier debates in the 60s and, and 70s. Norbert. Yeah, it's an interesting question, I, I, I would say. <clears throat> and actually, um, <clears throat> it, it allows me to argue for a moment about the quality, if you will, of the 68 movement in Germany, about the student uh, movement, <clears throat> which, which I would always argue was um, 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 motivated uh, in the beginning very much uh, through the undebated Nazi past. I mean, the fact that there was so much repression and that there was such a um, unclear situation regarding the elder generations and what what their uh, uh, professional careers in the in the Nazi period had been. This was really important for these 
young for these young students for the for the generation of the children of war born around 1945 in let's say the early 60s until the mid 60s the question of what have you done professor x uh, during the nazi past was rather important uh, until a certain point um, and the reaction of society also particularly the reaction of of the teachers and the professors uh, uh, again, uh, towards these questions um, was a main re was a main reason for the for the fact that the the interest um, on the Third Reich on Nazi history moved further and became more generalized an interest as an interest in fascism as uh, the question of um, everyday fascism, which is still going on, the idea of, of we have to fight imperialism, anti-capitalist uh, movements, all of that developed uh, from the mid 1960s on very rapidly. And indeed, <clears throat> also the, the Vietnam War has to, has to be uh, recalled here, um, all of that, made these these uh, protesters um, leaving the the uh, actual nazi past more and more aside and turning into uh, uh, the question of uh, imperialism and of course then anti-imperialist action so yes there is this impulse um, on the german west german left uh, and of course uh, in the GDR, there is support for anti-capitalist uh, nation building uh, in the process of decolonization. Uh, so there are certain parallels or certain even links. But uh, generally speaking, I would say the interesting thing about the West German left is that these people were actually those who from the mid 70s, late 70s on started to regain an interest in the Nazi past. And the, the whole process of history of from below, which was mentioned by Manuela and Michael, actually is a process initiated by those who by now are called the 68ers. Okay, um, Michael? Sure, I'll, I'll say a word. I can't say so much specifically about the German New Left or the, or the GDR Left in the 60s, but the distinction between the kind of memory that you have in the 60s and the kind that you have, let's say, in the early post-war, post-Cold War period is quite important to me. And for me, what, what I found, again, mostly in the sort of French and Francophone context was that in the, in the 60s, you did again have this kind of strong link between decolonization and an emerging Holocaust memory. So in other words, Holocaust memory was very politicized at that time, for some at least, on the left, not, not, necess not obviously for everybody, there were other currents. But you had a kind of politicized Holocaust memory. And then what happens, I think, in the 1990s, as Holocaust memory becomes globalized, Americanized, becomes kind of official cultural policy in Germany and in, other, in, and in Europe more broadly, is you get a link between Holocaust memory and human rights and a certain liberal model of human rights, which I think actually tends to depoliticize uh, that, that memory, at least in comparison to the 60s. So I think you have a really clear shift that takes place there across the end of the Cold War in that very moment when the Holocaust kind of goes global as a, as a memory culture. But I wonder if there isn't something then different going on today. It, it's still emerging, and, and, it's, and so it's, it's hard to say exactly. But you have, on the one hand, new forms. I mean, I, I hesitate to call them Holocaust memory. They're kind of anti-Holocaust memory that have emerged on the far right, right? All kinds of denial, relativization, instrumentalization in very ugly ways, sometimes coming from strange quarters that you might not expect. Um, and I think you have these new kind of emerging uh, politicized memory movements that have come out of Black Lives Matter, that have come out of post-migrant context in Germany, 
and in other places. And so I think we're in a moment of transition and flux for sure. And I, and I couldn't really name exactly what that is, but I think the question is right, that there's certainly a very big difference between what we saw in the 60s and then what gets consolidated, let's say in the 1990s and early 2000s. Thank you, Michael. Manuela, would you like to address this question? Um, to be honest, not necessarily. I mean, I don't have an expertise on, you know, how it, the 19, um, I've been listening very carefully and I find it really interesting because I, uh, I believe, um, I understand it as, you know, Michael's comment earlier that we could look at the 1980s and do more research into how in the 1980s, uh, Holocaust memory and, um, and, and memory of colonialism might have intersected. And I was just thinking, um, I mean, it would definitely be interesting. And I was just thinking about this, you know, in the 1980s uh, in Germany, the <clears throat> Geschichtswerkstättenbewegung, um, which, um, and, and which had, you know, aimed at, uh, you know, digging the local grounds and searching for um, the history of national socialism and very, in a, on a micro level and very local um, level, which is actually what is happening today also in the decolonizing movement, you know, with um, city tours and, uh, I mean, that's, that's basically, in the cities in Germany, that's what's actually happening, that uh, post-colonial groups are being formed um, called post Berlin Postcolonial, Jena Postcolonial, uh, Bremen Postcolonial, and so on. So they're actually writing in a very similar way um, the local colonial histories in a very similar way to what um, the Geschichtswerkstättenbewegung did in the 1980s. So that would be <laughs> really interesting, but your question was in the 1960s. I don't have any expertise on the 1960s, um, to be honest, but um, I, I I think it would really be interesting, as Norbert Frey also um, said, to maybe take a new look on the 1960s, at the 1960s, and how the 1968 uh, movement um, actually established links between uh, you know, decolonizing movements um, in, in the former colonies and uh, their work on making the history of national socialism more visible and um, so in in terms of also making visible that there is actually history of entangling these um, these histories that we tend to forget actually that's what i i, I just learned also from this panel dis discussion so that's um, not sharing expertise but sharing uh, my thoughts about that um, now and i'm really thankful for for these ideas that have come up. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, I see now we have many questions in the Q&A, so I'll turn it over to Francisco. There are several uh, about uh, Africa and uh, um, colonial history, uh, which has not been uh, uh, properly taught or uh, reflected upon in Germany. There is also there are also two questions uh, related about uh, um, about the United States as a colonizer of the past and present. Uh, could anyone comment about the current state of collective uh, U.S. memory in this area? And this is related to another one. Uh, do you believe there is a link between the suffering economy and growth of racism? Well, this is. Uh, um, I would, I would concentrate on these two areas of questions. Um, there are, there are, no, now we have an explosion, explosion of questions. Um, and you have also questions about the memory culture of the Holocaust and the German colonialism. How is it uh, connected? But we have been talking about it as well. So I think we could, we could start uh, with uh, perhaps uh, 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 Anna Lucia. There is one interesting question regarding uh, the, the memories uh, of uh, the dictatorships in Latin America 
and uh, whether or not they are related. And let me see where it is. Uh, in South America, we have memory movements in relation to the military dictatorship of the 1960s, 1980s. According to your research, are they connected also with racism? Uh, they are in many ways because uh, during these dictatorships, what uh, they were able to accomplish in countries like Brazil is to reinforce the idea that racism uh, never existed in countries like Brazil or in Latin America in general, that uh, more or less people lived in somewhat harmonious uh, racial uh, relations. And this, of course, uh, it was never true. Uh, then all this idea of racial democracy that you have in Brazil, first, it was never a racial democracy, and for more than 20 years, we didn't have a democracy. But one element that I think that is interesting, and again, regarding the, the multidirectional uh, memory, is that uh, I, I am finishing a, a very short book on representations of slavery in museums. And uh, one of the, the topics that emerges in many of these museums is uh, images of victimization. Then we have a lot of these uh, representations of uh, uh, enslaved people being beaten, being tortured, uh, naked uh, buttocks, being flogged at uh, whipping posts and so on. And uh, many of these museums, in the case of Brazil, now I'm not referring here to state museums, but especially to uh, community museums, museums in municipalities, all of them using usually the same kind of uh, visual images that are visual images of the 19th century uh, by a particular artist that is called Jean-Baptiste uh, Debré, a French artist who spent um, 16 years in Brazil. And uh, there, there is a clear connection between those images of torture, of victimization of black bodies with the bodies that were tortured then uh, and violated during the um, during the, the military dictatorship. Then there is that connection. Uh, another question also asked about uh, the case of the Caribbean. Then of course that the United States supported uh, dictatorships in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. But what is interesting in the particular case that was asked in one of the questions regarding Haiti is that Duvalier, then uh, Papa Doc, he uh, is one of uh, the, the first uh, rulers, the first presidents that uh, created and a monument uh, celebrating the, the, the unknown maroon. And this was used, then the image of uh, a slave rebel was used to, uh, to reinforce his image as uh, indeed uh, a dictator. Then uh, this is all the, the, the contradictory elements that you are going to see regarding how these, um, how these uh, politicians, these presidents, and how uh, then particular uh, dictatorships, they appropriate then these uh, this memories in order to fulfill their own uh, agendas. Thank you, Maria Lucia. <clears throat> that was very useful. Uh, um, we need now to, to, to have um, short answers if possible because we're arriving a little bit at the limit. So Manuela, please. I think there was a question you mentioned on on economy and... Uh, no, it was a question the, about, uh, about Africa and how the, the teaching and the memory has to do with the colonial history and not really uh, about the uh, history of Africa. Oh, so the question is whether, um, um, okay, is that, it's a comment basically that, um, that uh, European US universities are teaching the history of colonialism but not the history of Africa. Is that? It was more specifically about Germany. Okay, well, I, I, I mean, I can only take that as a comment which I would agree with. I mean, um, um, and uh, I mean, you have like chairs for the history of Africa in, in, in Germany, very few. <laughs> um, and uh, it's true that um, at many of these institutes, although they are called, you know, institutes of, 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 um, of uh, African studies, um, and they have chairs for the history of Africa, um, a lot of them actually do colonial history. I mean, that's, 
of course also colonial legacy it's uh, it's it's linked also to um, a problem of sources you know we have um, it we have quite an amount of uh, sources on colonial history uh, while um, we have uh, it's more complicated to research pre-colonial Africa um, and obviously um, when you're based in Berlin for instance it's very easy for you to go to the uh, National Archives and uh, do research on history that um, is being documented in um, in sources which have been drafted by colonialists. Um, it, it's, it's definitely a problem. And then, of course, the institutions like the, the Institute of African Studies in Germany, in Berlin, has a colonial history. I mean, it was uh, found, founded as um, an institute which, um, in the first place, um, um, served uh, colonial officers and uh, taught them languages uh, from the African continent and so on and prepared them for their colonial service. So, of course, I mean, we have all these um, legacies of colonial knowledge in at our universities and that's only one of many, many examples. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, our time is, is becoming less and less uh, um, uh, more restricted. So, um, uh, Michael, do, do you want to, to, would you like to make a final comment? Well, I, I could pick up a little bit the question that came in about memory of U.S. colonialism and I suppose U.S. neo-colonial interventions. And again, I'm not exactly an expert here, but my sense is as a, as a citizen and as, a, as well as as a scholar of memory culture is that there's really very little historical consciousness period in the United States. So there is truly very little memory of, of the US as a kind of colonial power. So in some sense, I'm very pessimistic about some of these questions uh, and the possibility that a, that a richer memory culture might emerge here. I mean, I think right now, and, and I and I'm not exaggerating, I feel like we're kind of in an emergency situation where it's not even clear whether we can remember what happened in February and March, right? We have a president who changes, uh, you know, who, who lies to us on a daily basis, uh, including about things that he might have said a few minutes earlier. And so can we even remember that? I think that's a really important question. And we'll, we'll find out in November how many people have been even paying attention to what's happened over the past few years. So when we think about a deeper memory, you know, I don't think it's really there. Um, you know, that said, um, I am, if I have optimism, it comes from these activist movements that have emerged in the last few years. And I'm certainly thinking about Black Lives Matter, which has been around for 13 years, really, but, uh, or seven years, rather, hmm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little confused, has been around for several years, but really hit a kind of critical mass this, uh, this summer, obviously, with the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery and others, and the, and the and massive demonstrations that followed. And these are not specifically movements that are about memory culture, but they have a strong memorializing and mnemonic dimension to them in that we are constantly uh, reminding ourselves and reminding others of this litany of victims of police violence and of white supremacism and vigilante violence more broadly. And I think that's a really important movement. And it's not just Black Lives Matter. You have the Equal Justice Initiative, right, which created the, the National Memorial to Lynching. Um, and that's, so there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of memories that we are just in the middle of, or even at the very beginning of unearthing, bringing into public, I hope that will continue, but there's so much that remains, uh, I'd say, in a state of oblivion in terms of U.S. history and particularly in U.S. histories of uh, violence in other countries. Thank you so much. You have uh, raised a, an interesting issue about the risk of the solution of collective memory with all the constant lies and constant... Uh, uh, imagine uh, facts that are thrown to the public all the time. That's a very interesting issue. Norbert, would you like to make a, a, a final comment, please? Yes, actually, I could uh, could take this up very well uh, because, indeed, I do think that a lot depends on the question whether we have a functional functional functioning public sphere. Yeah, um, this is something which is challenged now all over the world, given the 
allegedly social media and given the deterioration of the classical public sphere. Because if we look, if we take up what, what we discussed quite uh, thoroughly today, uh, this movement of history from below the Geschichtswerkstätten and all of that in, in Germany in the late uh, 70s, 80s, and, and their impact and how they actually uh, forced even one could even say forced uh, the the political sphere, the political class, to take up more seriously uh, the issue of the Nazi past. Then uh, they could do this only, I would say, because there was still a functioning public sphere. They could write articles for the newspaper. They could um, trust that uh, public broadcasting would be interested in their themes. They could uh, trust that people would buy catalogs, that a lot of um, classical media were working in their direction. And um, although I believe that, yes, there is a chance from uh, for history from below, also in the question of these decolonization issues, as uh, Manuela described for Berlin or other German cities. I mean, we have to um, remind ourselves that it is important to overcome the split of audiences and to, to have something um, that combines uh, um, uh, uh, voices again, in order to achieve something on the political level. I mean, and there's one more thing I should like to say about uh, the hesitation uh, in the political class about the topic of uh, colonization and decolonization. I mean, the question of reparation is still uh, important for them. And this is what makes them, them so careful because um, we have this history of compensation and Wiedergutmachung and uh, reparation uh, for the Nazi past. And of course, this is also something which is very present uh, in the political sphere as a model, which uh, they uh, always have in mind when they are asked to comment on uh, the German uh, colonial past and, and the uh, obligations which are coming from that uh, past. Thank you so much, you, you, Norbert. You have uh, also raised a very important issue: the uh, import, the, um, the um, deterioration of public sphere. So we are dealing with this with this deterioration for already uh, some time. That, that, that's uh, crucial for the future: uh, how to make this public sphere uh, functional. So. Um, for me, it was it was it has been a, a, an excellent uh, uh, panel and an excellent discussion. I think we have progressed a lot, and uh, many important issues were raised here, and new issues also were raised. Uh, and now I I would pass the floor to uh, Akasemi. Okay, for our final question, um, looking to the audience, I would like you all briefly, if you can to engage with the theme of comparison and entanglements, which all of you have alluded to, and particularly resistance that um, you may have seen in the historical record, but also uh, in conducting your own work uh, within academia to um, even the legitimacy of comparison and the legitimacy of raising these issues of um, entanglements and fears and concerns about relativization of the singularity of um, these um, important issues um, and episodes in, in, in histories of racism. So um, perhaps um, Ana Lucia, if you could begin and um, all of you could say something uh, to address that question. Yeah, I'm not sure um, 
exactly in terms of the the issue of resistance uh, and the the issue of comparison but um, one central element that it has been addressed by all of us doing work that uh, on slavery and at the same time on, on the holocaust either regarding memory of slavery and how slavery is memorialized but also regarding reparations it has been this a uh, common idea that, for example, that there were reparations for the victims of the Holocaust and why there was never reparations then to uh, the descendants of people who were enslaved in the Americas or reparations to Africa for uh, the, the genocide, for example, of Ejerero uh, in Namibia and so on. Then um, I, I, I believe that in terms of uh, us as scholars, what is the challenge is uh, to, to compare, to, uh, to use how they were uh, and the social actors, how they were inspiring uh, from uh, each other to, to develop their claims, but at the same time, by not putting a sort of hierarchy of uh, victimization or who is uh, then a, a sort of competition uh, between the, the victims of these atrocities. And I think that there is a lot to learn. For example, now with the Holocaust, we know that many of the, 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 the victims, the actual victims uh, than the, those who then were uh, interned in, in camps and so on and who survived. Many, many of these victims, they, they are uh, dying and this memory of the Holocaust will become at some point similar to that of slavery in terms of that the descendants will no longer be, uh, those who witnessed the, the atrocities will no longer be there. And I think it is in this frame that we should be working. And uh, regarding the issue of the public sphere, I am not so uh, pessimistic in terms of the deterioration of the public sphere. We have a different kind of public sphere. Social media is part of that. And I think that as scholars and as academics, we should also try to occupy these spaces in order to build them uh, in, and transform them in something that is, uh, that is positive. Thank you, Analysia. Any last comments to this question, Manuela, Norbert? Maybe, maybe I should uh, uh, and with not being pessimistic about the, the public sphere. Of course, I completely agree with Ana Lucia. We should occupy the social media, but I mean, we have to be aware of all the dangers which uh, Michael alluded to, uh, just uh, given the situation in the US at the moment. But if, if there's one lesson we can also take from from the history of uh, coming to terms with the Nazi past, then uh, in my sense, it is that we need endurance also with, with the topic of colonialism and post-colonialism. I mean, this was nothing which uh, took place immediately. It took decades to achieve where we, uh, to, to, to achieve the point uh, at which we are at the moment. And, um, I don't think that there's a big danger of relativization. Uh, I would also like to um, um, emphasize that it was interesting to me when I was studying in the field of uh, human rights issues in the last couple of years, that there are a lot of former Holocaust survivors who exactly engaged in this field in order to uh, do political work uh, in the human rights uh, sector and to promote uh, the, uh, these topics. I mean, this is something interesting to, to observe and also something which could give us uh, hope that uh, the course of uh, our topic will be taken on. Thank you. I was waiting for Manuela to join, but do you want to say something, Manuela? Yes, but you can go first if you want. Either uh, way. 
Sure. Okay. I'll say just quickly. I'll say, I mean, <laughs> I'm a great believer in the comparative imagination, as I would call it. And, and for me, comparison is an unavoidable feature of human cognition. I just don't think, I don't see how we can understand anything without a, a comparative perspective. That said, I think how we compare and why we compare matters. And so in my work, I've tried to, to, to develop what I call an ethics of comparison, where we can make distinctions between different kinds of comparisons, because all comparisons are not equal all comparisons are not necessarily justified. And so I think what's ultimately important to me is you know, what are the ethics and politics of comparison? And, but I would say, and I think this is very important for Germany, I think there's, an, there's a tendency in Germany to see any kind of relational approach, when we're talking about the Holocaust at least, as a form of relativization. And I just don't think that has to be true. And I think that there's a real, I think there, there's shifts going on, but I think there's still a, a long way to go in loosening a little bit some of the strictures around comparison of the Holocaust. I think comparison of the Holocaust can be done in a way which is ethically uh, uh, viable, and I think there's still a lot of resistance to that in Germany, and I think that that resistance is, instrument, is, is a kind of instrumentalization um, that is aligned with a kind of conservative politics often. And so I think, it's, I think it's important to kind of keep opening up these questions in the German context as elsewhere, but also to think about the ethics that lie behind these kinds of acts of comparison. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Manuela. Okay, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I, I actually wanted to take up uh, something that Anna mentioned on, um, on competition and on, you know, this uh, idea of, uh, we want reparations too, um, and uh, which has been mentioned by many of us. You know, this um, that that uh, people claiming reparations today are um, referencing um, reparations um, to um, to the Holocaust, which actually, well, you know, we could debate on <laughs> whether <laughs> these reparations actually were uh, made sense or were true reparations, whatever true reparations um, can be. But, um, and just wanted to share something that I, that I just read um, in an article from, um, by my uh, colleague Jihan Dean, uh, which I um, really loved for its, you know, very careful navigation of this issue of competitive uh, uh, memory, um, competition in the memory sphere. And she, um, or uh, Jihan uh, argues that um, what actually happens, and it takes actually the, the, the state as an agent back again into the field, what actually happens is that we have a state which creates representational privilege. And I like um, that notion very much because it helps us to um, make a difference between representational privilege and um, real privilege in terms of, you know, um, protecting people. So we have um, a state which grants in a certain way representation privileges for some and that creates jealousy, mistrust, competitions by some other people but at the same time we have a state which is actually not able to uh, grant real protection. I mean, we have seen um, the, the terrorist attacks on the synagogue in Halle and then the responses from the German state were basically where we're going to fund the intelligence service uh, more. So I don't think that's the right answer to uh, anti-Semitic uh, or any other racist attacks. Um, and I like very much this idea of representation privilege because I think it helps us to uh, make a differentiation and 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 question this idea of privilege um, on the one side and deep privilegeization on the other side. That's... Thank you, Manuela, and thank you to all of you. At this point, we are now six minutes over, so I want to send really my absolute warmest and earnest thanks to the audience for attending and participating, to the organizers, uh, the German Historical Institute and the Historica Verband, and then of course to our brilliant panelists, Ana Lucia Araujo, Michael Rothberg, Norbert Fry, Manuela Balcha, and of course Francisco for uh, leading with me this very interesting discussion.
please do stay tuned. We will have the second in this series on October 29th, uh, which will examine um, racism in history and context, this time focusing on pandemics and state violence. Thank you so much to you all.